that soap. Jaya Radha Madhava Kunjabi Hare Jaya Jaya Radha Madhava Kunjabi Gopi Janavalabha Giri Vada Gopi Janavalabha Giri Vada Hani Yashodanan Dana Raja Janadan Jana Yashodanan Dana Raja Janadan Jana Yamuna Tira Vanna Chani Yamuna Tira Vanna Chani Jaya Radha Madhava Kunja be Jaya Radha Madhava Kunja be Gopi Janavalava Giri Vanadhani Gopi Janavalava Giri Vanadhani Yashodanan Dana Raja Janadan Jana Yashodanan Dana Raja Janadan Jana Yashodanan Dana Raja Janadan Jana Yamuna Tira Vana Chari Yamuna Yamuna Tira Vana Chari Jaya Radha Madhava Kunjabi Hari Jaya Jaya Radha Madhava 
कुंज बिहारे जाए शिल प्रभु पाद की जाए अनंत कोटि वैष्णव बिंद की जाए Grantarasi Chaitanya Charitamrita ki Go Rabhimanande Is there a book that I could use? <clears throat> Nama Om Vishupadaya Krishna Pristaya Bhutale Srimate Bhaktivedanta Swamin Itinamine Namaste Saraswati Devi Gauravani Pracharine Nivishesha Shunyavani Paschatya Deshatarine Vancha Kalpatarubhyascha Kripa Sindhubhya Evacha Patitanam Pavanebhyo Vaishnavebhyo Namo Nama He Krishna Karana Sindhu Dinabandu Jagatpate Gopesha Gopika Kanta Radha Kanta Namasute Tapta Kanchana Gorangi Radhe Vrindavaneshvari Vishavanu Sute Devi Pranamami Hari Priye Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhar Shivasari Gaura Bhaktarinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare Jaya Jaya Shri Chaitanya Jaya Nityananda Jaya Jaya Advaita Chandra Jaya Gaura Bhakta Vrinda Jaya Jaya Shri Chaitanya Jaya Nityananda Jaya Advaita Chandra Jaya Gaura Bhakta Vrinda Jaya Jaya Shri Chaitanya Jaya Nityananda Jaya Dvita Chandra Jaya Gaura Bhakta Vrinda Shri Chaitanya Charitamrita Ki Jai Today we're reading from Sri Chaitanya Charitamrita Antilila Chapter 6, uh, which is called Lord Chaitanya Meets Raghunath Das Goswami. It's a nice, a nice meditation on uh, becoming a Hare Krishna. <laughs> it's a How I Became a Hare Krishna story. Uh, and last week uh, we came almost to the end, uh, not quite to the end of uh, the previous chapter, uh, which the last latter part of which was focused on an anonymous person, a Brahmin who's not named, uh, who approached uh, the devotees with a drama that he had written glorifying Lord Chaitanya. Uh, and uh, Swarup Damodar 
Goswami, who was kind of a kind of a gatekeeper uh, for all artistic, especially poetic, dramatic presentations that um, people would prepare for Lord Chaitanya. He was kind of a, I don't know, combined Jaya and Vijaya, perhaps, of, uh, of Puri uh, for Lord Chaitanya before something would before Lord Chaitanya would be subjected to some kind of uh, faulty uh, dramatic composition, uh, first it would go through uh, mm, Sarv Damodar. And so we read about we read about how this uh, well-intentioned Brahman had uh, presented something which even already in the first verse. Uh, the opening verse of the drama had a, a philosophical problem with it. But then Sarab Damodar says, well, maybe we can salvage this with a little help from Saraswati. And then he uh, gives some explanation of how it can be taken as indeed a proper gl- glorification of the, of the Lord. Uh, and then he is brought into uh, the circle of the Vaishnavas, and that's sort of the happy ending. And so um, I wanted to point out briefly, uh, in case you're not aware of it, uh, there's this very nice, very compact uh, summary. In fact, it's called Chaitanya Charitamrita Compact, a summary study of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's life story uh, by Sutta Prabhu in uh, Bhaktivedanta manner. It's a quick start re- uh, way of getting into Chaitanya Charitamrita. So if you find yourself overwhelmed with Chaitanya Charitamrita, where to start, how to start, what to do with this book, then I do recommend uh, his little uh, quick start book. And what I want to call attention to specifically here, he divides the entire um, Chaitanya Charitamrita into 12 themes and um, in Antilila uh, the first 13 chapters he identifies as having two themes that go back and forth and one of the themes is appreciation appreciation of devotees and the other theme is correction correcting devotees uh, correcting the Vaishnavas. And so all of this combined together, we may think uh, for a minute, who do we remember from the first uh, five chapters of Antilila, those of you who are re- regulars here, uh, who have been, whoops, have been glorified or have been appreciated in the first five chapters. Anyone can remember who? We have, <laughs> yeah, in the first five chapters of Antya Lila, some devotees are appreciated. Can we remember who, uh, which devotees, any, any one or two or three? Yes. Haridas Thakur is appreciated, yes, in chapter three. Anyone else? Sanatan Goswami, um, in the first five chapters, possibly, yes. I'm thinking of one more Goswami in the first first chapter. Rupa Goswami is very much appreciated. And I think with Rupa Goswami, we have an interesting sort of um, parallel and contrast with this uh, anonymous Brahmin whose verse was not appreciated, but then it became appreciated. Because with Rupa Goswami, a a sort of major uh, portion of this appreciation is appreciating one particular verse which he writes. Uh, And it's appreciated by Chaitanya Mahaprabhu directly. And why is it appreciated? Because he understands that Rupa Goswami understands him. (laughs) that he understands his, Lord Chaitanya's, mood. But then there's also correction, 
and indeed, as we uh, pointed out, a correction of um, this anonymous Brahman. Who else can we remember? Any corrections? Chota Haridas, yes, that's uh, uh, quite an extreme case, we may say, a case of what one scholar calls hard bhakti. <laughs> uh, any others? Yes? Uh, yeah. Yes. Well, uh, it's been a while since I've looked at this part myself. Truths, true to be said, truth to be told. Um, okay, we had Haridas Thakur, and then um, what about Bhagavan Acharya? We don't hear so much about Bhagavan Acharya, but he was he was a, a renounced uh, devotee in Jagannath Puri. Uh, and he was studying Vedanta, but what was the Vedanta he was studying? It was impersonal interpretation. Uh, and uh, Swarup Damodar, again, corrects him for his under misunderstanding. Um, and also, what about Damodar Pandit? Do you remember who is Damodar Pandit? And what was his... <laughs> What was his problem? Bossy. <laughs> In what way specifically? Huh? Stepped over a the line, yes. Um, at one time, Lord Chaitanya was frequently meeting one young boy whose father had died. And Damodar became worried about this. Why would Damodar become worried about this? Yes. Yes. So, r relating with the son of a widow, you know, that starts to sound questionable. Uh, and so, uh, Lord Chaitanya told Damodar, he didn't tell the widow to leave or the boy to leave, he told Damodar to leave Jagannath Puri <laughs> and go, go to Navadvi. Go, you're a very nice devotee, but please, actually, my mother needs some care. Why don't you go and take care of her? So we see also Lord Chaitanya as being um, quite expert in engaging devotees. You know, uh, Damodar was causing something of a disturbance uh, in this case, and so he sent him away. All right, so uh, these two things are going on, and, and they're, we can say they're kind of complementing each other. Now we come to chapter 6, and of course it's going to be very much an appreciation uh, of Raghunatha. So I'll read the summary because we're actually beginning the chapter. Uh, this is Bhaktivinoda Thakur's from his Amrita Pravaha Bhasya. When Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu went into transcendental fits of ecstatic love, Ramananda Rai and Sharup Damodar Goswami attended to him and satisfied him as he desired. Raghunath Das Goswami had been attempting to come to the lotus feet of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu for a long time. And finally he left his home and met the Lord. When Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu had gone to Shantipur on his way to Vrindavan, Raghunath Das Goswami had offered to dedicate his life at the Lord's lotus feet. In the meantime, however, a Muslim official became envious of Hiranyadas, Raghunath Das Goswami's uncle, and induced some big official court minister to have him arrested. <laughs> Thus, Hiranyadas left his home, but by the intelligence of Raghunath Das, the misunderstanding was mitigated. 
that's where we're going to come in uh, in the verse that we'll read. Then Raghunath Das went to Panihati, and following the order of Nityananda Prabhu, he observed a festival. Well, what's the name of that festival? The Panihati festival, or what else? <laughs> the yogurt and rice festival. <laughs> yes, Chida Dadi Mahotsava. By distributing chipped rice mixed with yogurt. The next day, the day after the festival, Nityananda Prabhu gave Raghunath Das the blessing that he would very soon attain the shelter of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Would you like to get the blessing of Nityananda Prabhu that you will soon attain the shelter of Lord Chaitanya? Yes? yes? So, maybe we should be attentive to this chapter. How did Raghunath do it? How did he get it? After this incident, Raghunath Das, with the help of his priest, whose name was Yadunandana Acharya, got out of his house by trickery. Is, tricky, is trickery um, bona fide yes. in devotional service? <laughs> in certain cases, uh, it seems to be bona fide. It's part of our tradition. Not touching the general path, Raghunath Das Goswami secretly went to Jagannath Puri. After 12 days, he arrived in Jagannath Puri at the lotus feet of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu entrusted Raghunath Das Goswami to Sharup Damodar Goshai. Therefore, another name for Raghunath Das Goswami is Sharuper Raghu. Sharuper Raghu. The Raghu of Sharup. The Raghunat of Sharup Damodar. For five days, Raghunat Das Goswami took prasadam at the temple, but later he would stand at the Singhadvara gate and eat only whatever he could gather by alms. Later, he lived by taking alms from various chhatras or food distribution centers. When Raghunat's father received news of this, he sent some men and money. But Raghunath Das Goswami refused to accept the money, understanding that Raghunath Das Goswami, if you were, were Raghunath and you had a wealthy father and he sends you money, would you refuse it? Mm, uh uh. No? Raghunath refused it. Understanding that Raghunath Das Goswami was living by begging from the chhatras, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu presented him with his own gunja mala. And what else did he give him? Yes, a stone from Govardhan Hill. Thereafter, Raghunath Das Goswami used to eat rejected food that he had collected and washed. This renounced life greatly pleased both Sharuk Damodar Goswami and Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. One day, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu took by force some of the same food, thus blessing Raghunath Das Goswami for his renunciation. Nowadays we would say, not a good idea, not healthy. Eating rejected food that's going to make you sick. Bad idea. Anyway, this is what it says. I'll just read the first verse and uh, summarize. Well, we read summary and then we'll come to this verse. Kripa gunarya kugridhanda kupa udritya raghunatadasam nyasya sarupe viradentarangam Shri Krishna Chaitanyam Amung Prapadye. 
When the ropes of his causeless mercy, sorry, with the ropes of his causeless mercy, Sri Krishna Chaitanya Mahaprabhu employed a trick to deliver Raghunath Goswami from the blind well of contemptible family life. He made Raghunath Das Goswami one of his personal associates, placing him under the charge of Sarup Damodar Goswami. I offer my, my obeisances unto him. Um, Prabhupada is giving a rather strong uh, translation to the word ku griha. Um, the, griha, of course, means house, uh, but it can also mean the ashram, griha, sta. Um, but the word ku, the prefix ku, has a sense of bad, um, yeah, bad and unfortunate and such ideas. Um, so ku griha, and then anda kupat. Uh, what does anda mean? Huh? Andha. We have anda means blind. Kupa means well. Yes, kupat from the blind well. So Raghunath was. A, it seems that he had that feeling that this situation I'm in, it's like a blind well. I'm getting out of here. But there were obstacles. And this is something we may reflect on uh, in our devotional lives, aspiring for devotional service, pure devotion. Uh, what sort of obstacles are there? Someone once... Uh, there was a theme of a of a festival we had obstacles to uh, pure devotional service. Maybe it was last year in uh, Singachalam, or maybe two years ago. And I was thinking, obstacles to pure devotional service? There are no obstacles. <laughs> if it's pure devotional service, there are no obstacles. <laughs> but okay, uh, that's all very well. <laughs> We can say things like that, but then uh, we experience, we may feel we experience obstacles, and we may say these obstacles take two forms, internal obstacles and external obstacles. And what we're reading about here are, I think we could say safely, external obstacles. Because R Raghunath really wants to... Uh, he wants to leave home and he wants to join Lord Chaitanya, but there are um, there are obstacles, and they're not internal obstacles; they're external. Uh, and we could say the initial external obstacle is that he is a member of a a quite wealthy family, and it seems one reason they're wealthy has to do with tax collecting. Uh, the brother of his father is a tax collector. And uh, it seems, <laughs> the tradition seems to be that the tax collector was, could be quite wealthy because he was allowed to keep 25% of whatever he collected. That's a big chunk of money if you're collecting taxes from, a, from an area. So you could imagine, and it struck me this may uh, be why a tax collector is called a choduri. Uh, choduri, chatur, I think it's related to chatur, which means four, so maybe it has to do with one-fourth. Um, so the one who collects one-fourth is a choduri, and choduri is a family name. You see it in Bengal today, which we come to here. Um, so this is, uh, it turns out, uh, quite an obstacle for Raghunath Das, that he's coming from this wealthy family. Okay, here we go. Hanakale mulukir ekam lecha adikari. Hanakale mulukir ekam lecha adikari. 
Shaptagram Mulukir Se Hoy Choduri Shaptagram Mulukir Se Hoy Choduri Others Nakale at this time Mulukir of the country Eka one Mlecha Muslim Adikari official Saptagram Mulukir of the place known as Saptagram She that person Hoy is Choduri tax collector Translation purport by its divine grace AC Bhaktivedanta Swami Srila Prabhupada Jai. Translation, at that time, there was a Muslim official collecting the taxes of Saptagram. Purport, formerly, when the Muslim government was in power, the person appointed tax collector would collect the taxes of the local zamindars, or landholders. He would keep one-fourth of the collection for himself as a prophet and the balance he would deliver to the treasury of the government. You can imagine that um, such ta tax collectors were highly motivated uh, to do their job. And you can also imagine that whenever the tax collector came, to, uh, came knocking on the door, everyone would run and hide uh, because they didn't want to give, especially knowing that one quarter of what they're giving is giving to this rascal tax collector guy. Um, it seems that um, traditions uh, are elsewhere in the world of tax collectors not being popular. Um, in the time of Jesus, in, uh, in what is now Israel, Judea, uh, tax collectors were considered very uh, persona non grata. And uh, this was one of the sorts of people that uh, Jesus would preach to. And they would become followers. They would become his devotees. And this was considered quite astonishing. Why would you talk to a tax collector? 
One of the things we can appreciate uh, from Chaitanya Charitamrita in general uh, is the sort of juxtaposition or this, the, the fact that we're, we're hearing the transcendental pastimes of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu as they occur in this world in which there are all of the non-transcendental uh, elements of yeah, material life. And we can see from the Chaitanya Charitamrita, we can be reminded, um, well, we may say, of what we know only too well. <laughs> and that is that we are in the material world where uh, things go on uh, in their material ways, in their mundane ways. And we may find ourselves, um, well, sometimes interacting with in uh, in quite... Um, unproblematic ways, but at other times we may find them prob problematic. Uh, and sometimes we take for granted, I would say, uh, here in the West, uh, the, the political uh, context in which we, at the present time, are practicing Krishna consciousness. It's a political situation in which essentially people don't bother us. <laughs> we can go on chanting Hare Krishna, uh, we can have public events, uh, we can go out on the streets uh, wearing strange clothes, uh, <laughs> what are considered strange, what wouldn't have been strange in Lord Chaitanya's time, uh, and so on. Uh, uh, paying of taxes, well, mm, that goes on. Um, Householders, you may know very well about paying of taxes. Those of you who are running businesses, uh, you know about all of these things. I was reminded also of uh, the uh, statement attributed to Jesus in uh, the gospel, one or more of the gospels, uh, when he was asked, what about taxes? <laughs> Do we pay our taxes? And uh, and, and Jesus is said to have said, yeah, yes, um, what belongs to Caesar, give it to Caesar, something like that. He was shown a coin. Render unto Caesar what is Caesar's. Thank you. What? Yes, that's sort of the key point, right? Uh, but some have theorized that actually that text... Uh, was sort of sponsored uh, by the later Roman emperors uh, to encourage people, you know, pay your taxes. <laughs> in any case, we find ourselves in all sorts of contexts, and some of these may, may uh, ex we may experience them as as obstacles. Uh, and uh, this becomes a challenge. At which time, when we encounter obstacles, what do we want to do when we encounter external obstacles? We want to look within and see, is this external obstacle, as I am experiencing it, perhaps a reflection of an obstacle within? Could it be that Krishna is sending me this external ob obstacle because of something within my heart, uh, which is uh, in, is the actual obstacle, and so uh, we hear so many times and in so many ways how important it is to hear, <laughs> because this hearing is penetrating through into the heart. And it struck me this morning this verse we're all familiar with from uh, Kapila Dev. Um, Satang prasangang mama virya samvido bhavanti hrit karna rasayana kata tajosha nat asapavarga vartmani shradha bhaktir no shradha ratir bhaktir anukram ishyati so in that verse it's about associating with devotees and what happens in association of devotees is 
Bhavanti hrit karna rasayana kata. Now usually, hrit karna rasayana. What means hrit? Heart. And what means karna? Ear. And we usually have the translation uh, heart and ears, uh, which is a proper translation, but because it's a samasa, it's a compound, uh, compounds can be taken in different ways. And here's where the plot thickens, uh, that you could say the ears of the heart, the heart's ears, rasayana kata, the uh, the Rasayana Kata, that uh, reservoir of rasa, uh, which is the Kata about Krishna, uh, Virya of the the, the heroic Lord, uh, that penetrates or it can penetrate uh, to the heart ears, or rather, if the if the heart ears are open, then we can. Uh, access uh, we can access we can it can go both ways <laughs> uh, that kata can enter into us and so there is so much emphasis we want to hear from sadhus uh, sat the word sat means existence it also means uh, persons who are living in reality in the higher truth of uh, spirituality of Krishna consciousness and therefore, when we can hear from them, then uh, we can benefit. Uh, Shiva Ram Swami makes a nice point in one of his uh, writings on this subject. He says, association with uh, advanced devotees doesn't mean just socializing. <laughs> we, we, we all like to socialize. Uh, but he said, it's, you know, it's more than that. It's, it's hearing about serious subjects. Uh, and and this is then tat joshanat. It's a cultivation, a cultivation of the heart. And the word cultivation um, reminds me of what we normally associate with cultivation, and that is gardening. And I um, sort of dusted off one some notes of a talk I gave once on cultivation and caring. Um, these are reflections on uh, one person's uh, book uh, named Harrison, who wrote Gardens, an essay on the human condition. Uh, and I just wanted to refer to a couple of quotes that he refers to in his book. One is from W.B. Yeats. Anyone heard of W.B. Yeats? He was an Irish poet, 20th century Irish poet, early 20th century. Uh, and he said in a, uh, in a poem called Prayer for My Daughter, he said, hearts are not had as gifts, but hearts are earned by those that are not entirely Beautiful. Hearts are earned by those who are not entirely beautiful. That's interesting. <laughs> heart, what does it mean to earn a heart, we may ask? That's the first question. And then beyond that, what does it mean to be not entirely beautiful? Well, I would take not entirely beautiful as, as meaning we're conditioned. We're in this material world and in the spiritual world, everyone is entirely beautiful. Here we are not entirely beautiful. Our bodies, to start with, and maybe our minds at times, and maybe sometimes our words are not entirely beautiful. And so we have to earn our hearts. But earning our hearts, how do we do that? Again, it comes back to this hearing. And this led me to 
uh, a philosophical book called uh, Saints and Postmodernism by uh, Edith Wiskogrut. Um, that's a Polish name. I think she's, she was an American scholar, New York University. Um, very interesting book in which she's trying to, we could say, salvage the value of hearing or reading about saints. Because nowadays, you know, modern, actually many people would say postmodern, it's like, saints, are you serious? You know, give me a break. That's a joke. There are no saints. Uh, so she's kind of salvaging the idea that it actually is a good idea to hear about saints uh, in their, and you may object, you may say, but those stories of saints, it's all hagiography. You know what is hagiography? Hagiography is a biography of a saint. But because it's a biography of a saint, it's very likely that uh, it's not, strictly speaking, historically uh, accurate. It's maybe more of a glorification of the saint. Hmm? So we're reading about Raghunath Das Goswami, and one might skeptically say, "Ah, oh, this is a lot of his, a lot of hagiography, eating, you know, rejected food." I mean, okay, maybe he did that once, but I don't believe he was doing that day after day, or week, or month, or year after. Year. Anyway, our skeptical minds are there. So, uh, Edith, Edith uh, Viskogrud says. We can learn how and with what intensity to care from hagiographical accounts of saints. We can learn how and with what intensity to care, to care uh, from hagiographical accounts of saints. So again, cultivation and care, this is the theme. And my suggestion is that hearing about Raghunath Goswami, the, the challenges that he met and then the austerities that he increasingly goes through and also uh, the blessings that he gets, the, uh, actually the fun. This, there's a fun part in this chapter uh, when he meets Nityananda Prabhu uh, because Nityananda Prabhu is going to say, He's going to, when he first meets him, he's going to say, you rascal. But he's going to be in, in a joking way. You have, you're, you have been hiding. Come here. And he's going to call him forward, and he's going to scold him. And he's going to punish him. How is he going to punish Raghunath Das? Yes, he has to feed all the devotees. He knows Raghunath's a, a son of a wealthy man. So, okay, you've got some money. Let's use your money for some... Let's have a party. <laughs> and Raghunath is very happy to do that, isn't he? So that's, that's, that's a wonderful thing. Uh, Raghun, how many of you have been... Who has been uh, to Radha Kund and been to the uh, Samadhi... Um, and Bhajan Kutir of Raghunath Das Goswami, who's been there, many of you. Yeah, of course. Uh, it has a nice feeling, isn't it? Uh, to be there, you can feel a little bit the, the sense that Raghunath was here. Um, you want to see a sign? Raghunath was here. Uh, <laughs> so. But what is it behind? Uh, what is it that we appreciate about these devotees? That uh, they are, uh, what, what is their greatness, we can say? We learn about how and to what extent of intensity of their care uh, from which we can ourselves benefit our hearts so that our Heart's ears, the ears of our hearts, <laughs> can can capture uh, the words of Krishna and his devotees. Uh, okay, so 
one could go into more detail on that, but I sort of said what I would do. Speaking of care, uh, I've just written a book, and it's just been published, so now comes um, my show-and-tell session. When I was a kid in school, we had show-and-tell. The kids were asked to bring something to school and show it. Yeah, you do that. So now I'm bringing something to school and showing. Uh, so this is the book. It's called Cow Care in Hindu Animal Ethics. And um, yes, I'm very happy that it's come out uh, finally. I spent, um, well, over two years, uh, close to three years, working on the book from uh, when I was invited to write it. I was invited by the editor of a book series uh, on animal ethics. If you like, we can pass this around. Um, I would like to get it back. Let's start with the, let's start with the ladies. Why not? Um, can look at the table of contents. Hmm? It's available. Uh, in fact, it's not available here. Uh, but you can order it online. And it's available in digital format, completely free of charge. Uh, I arranged for this. We did a fundraising action. Um, and uh, we're, we were able to raise the funds, which made it possible to, uh, to make it through uh, what's called open access contract, to make it freely available in PDF format or EPUB format. <laughs> uh, but that format, uh, it's not yet available on the regular page of the publisher, nor uh, from Amazon, but it is available through the parent company of this company. <laughs> if you want to note it down, you can find it this way. You type in link, L-I-N-K, period, then Springer, as in spring with E-R, Springer, dot com. And then from there you search. And you, I think you'll find it with cow care. You'll find the, uh, that link. And there you'll see how to download it. So you can download the book. Um, or you can order it as a hardbound book. Probably the softbound will be another two years. They usually wait two years before. Um, the subject of the book is cows, but the subject is also, broadly speaking, animal ethics, uh, because the series in which the book is published is on animal ethics. Um, what is animal ethics? Well, it's the ethics, it's the subject of how should human beings relate with animals. <laughs> uh, the series already has 37 different titles uh, and it's steadily expanding. Uh, the editor of the series uh, is a very wonderful gentleman in Oxford uh, who's himself written numerous books on this subject uh, from a Christian perspective mainly. He's himself a Christian minister. And uh, some years back, he invited me um, through his institute. I was uh, giving a presentation. He said, why don't you write a book on Hinduism and animal ethics for our series? And I kind of shrugged my shoulders because I was working on something else at the time and uh, didn't pursue it, discussing with him. Then a year later, he asked me again, why don't you write a book on Hinduism and animal ethics? And by this time, I had found out that uh, someone else was in the process of writing a book on Indian religion and animal ethics. And I said, but such and such is, all, is writing a book on this. And he said, no, but your book will be different. Um, why don't you write a book? And I just kind of said, yeah, interesting idea. I'll think about it. And then a year later, again, he asked me, why don't you write a book on Hinduism and animal ethics? And 
again, I was shrugging my shoulders, and he said, I want you to write it because you are a practitioner. And when he said that, some little bells started going off in my head, and I thought, this is starting to sound like Krishna wants me to do something. <laughs> And so then I started thinking, yes, but that's a huge topic, and how to approach it. And then another voice came from somewhere, maybe it was from the Hrit Karna I heard, uh, saying, cows. And so I asked this, uh, the editor, the professor, what if I would focus on cows and Hinduism and animal ethics. And he said, great, go for it, do it. So that's how we ended up writing about this subject. And um, yeah, it, it's an academic uh, publisher, which means you go through, you have to go through academic uh, peer review. Um, so I did that for the proposal, and that went quite all right. Uh, no problems, some suggestions were there. Uh, but then it's supposed to go through a second peer review once you've finished the manuscript. So I sent in the manuscript, and the lady who manages the manuscripts wrote back and said, this is wonderful, you're the first person this year, and this was s six months into the year, she said, you're the first person this year who's actually uh, done properly in the right format and with all the details of sending in the, you've done everything correctly. You're the first person who did it correctly this year. So in her happiness, she said, I'm, I'm just going to send the manuscript to uh, the series editor, who is this man who invited me to write it. And if he approves it, then we'll skip the peer review. And that's what happened. Um, <laughs> which is kind of, um, it's kind of a no-no, but anyway, the, the, the editor said, this book is fine, there's no problem. <laughs> mm. So what is it trying to do? We already have uh, two or three books on this subject. Uh, Satyaraj Prabhu has written a book called Holy Cow, which is very nice. There's also, uh, by my godbrother Ranchor Prabhu, a book, I forget the title, but he focuses on um, um, Bhaktivedanta Manners Goshala. So he, um, it's more specific in that way. Uh, there, are several, there are many books from one uh, devotee, I've not met him, uh, Dr. Sahadev. In, I think he's uh, living in, uh, I know he's in India near Hyderabad, Secunderabad, I believe. He's written many small books, mainly small books on cow protection and so on. So these are all very good in their ways, um, but these are not books that are going to be uh, looked at with any care, <laughs> with any uh, special attention, I would say, by scholars and by a more educated audience who may be looking for, uh, how to say, um, a more, maybe systematic's not the word, but a more comprehensive uh, presentation. So this is what I'm trying to do in this book. We start in the first chapter with an overview of uh, the literary history. We go, we start with the Rig Veda, and we come up through the Bhagavatam to give a literary survey. The next chapter is modern history, starting with late 19th century, uh, what is comes to be called the um, cow protection movement, and this gets into the politics of cow protection, which becomes a major issue uh, up to the present day in India, uh, and I discuss that. I discuss also another sort of intellectual controversy uh, it has to do with uh, whether animals uh, in traditional uh, or ancient India 
have indeed been sacrificed in ritual in the in yagyas or not because some some people uh, say no this was never done um, so I needed to go into details about that. Srila Prabhupada, of course, says it was done, uh, but it was done by persons who were qualified to do it, and by doing, Prabhupada says, uh, and it's indicated in Chaitanya Charitamrita, the animals would be rejuvenated. Um, so I talk about that. I introduce uh, four personalities in the um, cow protection movement um, with the fourth being our very own Srila Prabhupada. And the striking feature of Srila Prabhupada's involvement in the cow protection movement is that he has nothing to do with the idea of Hinduism um, being what we're concerned with. He's not interested in Hinduism, he's interested in cows, and he's interested in Brahmins, cows and Brahmins. Uh, so I talk about that. Third chapter, I go into present day uh, practices in India, and for this, I did some exercise. I uh, traveled a bit around, a <clears throat> little bit around North India, Western India, I visited some goshalas, I met with cow, cow care, I like to call it cow care, uh, activists, and, um, and I quote some of them in the book, and I refer to some of the issues, the problems, the economics of cow protection. Then in the next chapter is where I get into the animal ethics in general, um, um, where we have in the West a tradition already, well, a tradition you could say goes back to Aristotle, but the modern tradition goes to the 19th century of articulating why it is that humans should not be killing animals and eating them, especially, or should not be experimenting on animals and so on. Uh, so this goes into the idea of animal rights, well, we don't really have a notion of animal rights in our tradition, um, but I, I, arf, I offer uh, three traditions which, when we put them in the right perspective, are supporting a new sort of Western animal ethics uh, which grows out of, it's very new, coming from 1980s, uh, the ethics of care. The ethics of care, interestingly enough, uh, er, uh, emerges out of, or it, it's come out of, uh, feminist philosophy, feminist thought, where uh, the emphasis is on the relationship between mothers and their children. And the basic, basic idea of the ethics of care is mothers know how to care for their children, and they know because they care for their children. <laughs> and out of that, then they, un they unpack potential possibilities for uh, applications in a wider public sphere. Then that gets uh, drawn into animal ethics, and f this is where I bring in dharma, yoga, and bhakti. And specifically with bhakti, we have some metaphysics which can back up, which can support uh, uh, ethics of care. So my idea was, can we bring the two into conversation? Uh, not just to say, you know, well, Hindus we believe this, that, and the other thing, because then people will say, well, that's Hindus. Who cares about Hindus? <laughs> And I say in the book also, we don't really care about Hindus. Uh, <laughs> I mean, we care about Hindus, but we don't care about them being thinking that they're Hindu, because we're not about being Hindu or not Hindu. Um, and then in the next chapter, the next chapter is, uh, is, is about the f possible future for cows. And this is where I bring in two, uh, what I call taking from 
uh, one uh, a Christian scholar, the idea of anticipatory communities. Anticipatory community, uh, you may now tell your friends, is what you are associated with here in Radhadesh. This you can call an anticipatory community, where we are anticipating through our activities, through our culture, through everything we do here, including the care for cows. Uh, we are anticipating what could be practiced on a wider scale throughout the world. So I present two communities, Mayapur and New Vrajadam, one in India, one in the West, as samples, as very, very uh, brief ideas of how uh, such a community could be done. Again, I talk about the economics involved uh, and other aspects, but essentially trying to focus on uh, the uh, the culture, the 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 philosophy, uh, the ethics, and um, and the the possibility that this can be done in a wider scale. I also address the vegans. So, uh, is veganism a good idea? Well, it's a very good idea, up to a point. <laughs> up to a certain point, they have a point that uh, animals uh, should not be exploited. However, I argue that uh, to milk a cow that is protected for life and to care nicely for this cow, we see that cows like it. <laughs> and because they like it, they will give, uh, they'll give more milk than cows that are not cared for. And so this is an indicator that uh, not only is it all right, it's, it's, uh, it is a confirmation of a, an understanding uh, which we have from our scriptures uh, that, in fact, there is a higher order which is uh, given by Krishna's. Uh, it's an order which is uh, mm, so much uh, essential to uh, the ways of the world that Krishna himself comes as a cowherd. And what does Krishna do all day? <laughs> How does he spend his time? Uh, he spends his time with the cows. Uh, so like that. So now we are um, beginning uh, discussions, explorations of how to make this book as widely accessible to people as possible, uh, hoping that uh, this may be a, a way to lead people to think about, to talk about, and uh, to write more about uh, the subject. I think of this book as really just one, yeah, one brick uh, in, in an edifice that uh, we need to build uh, for people to say, hmm, yes, here's something we can take part in. This is something we can do. We could do something like this. Yeah, so that's, that's what I've been up to. Uh, and that's my um, show and tell for now. Hare Krishna. Grantaraj Shri Chaitanya Charitamrita Ki. Cow Care Ki. Questions, comments? Yes, Bhutta Bhavan Prabhu. Hare Krishna. A question based upon something you said earlier. You shouldn't think of Colin as a cow. Yeah. <laughs> well, here's something. The, the question is about trickiness, what are the uh, appropriate circumstances. In the case of Raghunath, it was a case of getting free from this external obstacle because this, uh, this Chaudhary was kind of keeping him as ransom because his uncle, whom he wanted to arrest, uh, had disappeared because the young, anyway, it had to do with replacing him 
uh, not getting his money. So, but for Raghunath, it was about getting away so he could go meet Lord Chaitanya. The principle here uh, would certainly be where there are circumstances which are obstructing one's service. If there is no actual harm to others, uh, we may, in certain circumstances, and it's hard to give exact, um, you know, limitations to those. In certain circumstances, some some uh, telling of uh, some slight untruth or partial truth might be the way that we proceed. Example from my own life, we used to, we called it the third, uh, the third Vaishnava sport. Uh, we used to smuggle books into East Europe. So, you know, do you have anything to declare at the border? Declare? Why, yes, um, we have this cheese, for example, or, you know, whatever. <laughs> Uh, maybe we're not being completely honest, but then, then again, why would you want to be honest in that circumstance? <laughs> but it's it uh, it's tricky. the The subject of how and when and where to be tricky or not tricky is tricky uh, because it's uh, it's easy to uh, make it an excuse. Uh, to make it, um, yeah, I could tell of other circumstances where we certainly went over the boundary uh, in our younger days, and it wasn't appropriate. Well, I can say um, in 1975 in Germany, the famous case where uh, the the police came and arrested the devotees and confiscated all the money they had collected uh, over some months. It was quite a large sum of money, but how they were collecting the money, this was the problem. They were uh, telling stories which just were not true. They were saying, we are helping, uh, we are collecting for starving children in Bangladesh. That was the mantra. And it wasn't going to starving children in Bangladesh. It was going to a bank account in Germany. And the aim was to collect to buy uh, some large property to build a temple. So Krishna showed that he didn't approve of that uh, by himself collecting the money uh, <laughs> through the police. <laughs> And uh, then eventually they they kept that money, um, and I think they distributed it to charities of various sorts, which, okay, so we ended up collecting for some charities. Uh, Hare Krishna. <laughs> yeah. Oh, uh, you're speaking of later. Right, in Puri, they brought him some money. The, in Puri, they brought him money. And your question is whether he accepted it? Oh, yeah. It says that he did not accept it. And that's why I raised the question, would you accept it if you were given? He did not accept it. He was, um, his mood was, I have renounced. So there's no question of again accepting something, you know, how will that, that won't work. So he's, he rejected Mm, 
Yeah. Yes. Yes, or possibly a combination of both. <laughs> I would say uh, he was he was affirming. I am now taking shelter of the Lord, and as such, I am depending on the Lord. I'm not depending on my father. Uh, and yes, this money that's coming is anyway. Who knows uh, how it's been uh, how it's been gained. Uh, so, thank you, but no thank you. That was his mood. Yeah. Yes, Jai Bhatt. Um, maybe in some of the years, I, I was listening to a class at Amaranta Prabhu, mm. and he was, he was saying that Brahmins don't have to ask themselves, but that they were able to remove, by their mantra, remove the souls from the body. Right, okay. No. Uh, the thing is, what is needed for a book of this sort, being a scholar, you know, academic book, one needs references. And from all the research I did on, um, on animal sacrifice in the Vedas, it never says that. That doesn't mean it's not there, but I didn't find it. What it says, and it also doesn't say anything about renewal. Um, it it says what it says is they will they will go to heaven, and that's I think an, a way of understanding renewal. I do refer, I think, in a footnote uh, to the reference by devotees. Uh, and in Chaitanya Charitamrita to this idea. So I say, what I can say is, it is there is this tradition amongst Vaishnavas that this is what happens. So that's bona fide, you can say that. People say this, and this is where they say it. But I can't say this is what was done, um, because e even if it's even if there's a reference to it, in let's say Rig Veda, you still can't say this is what was done. All you can say is this is what they said was done. <laughs> it's anyway, it gets into complexities. <laughs> is that okay? Is that all right? Yes, Chaiba. Mm. Isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. And then it. Lord Chaitanya, uh, Raghunath was lucky. He had Lord Chaitanya right there in Puri. Just had to go and meet Lord Chaitanya. Uh, so, yeah, well, that's a big subject um, of how do we accelerate, right? How do we accelerate the process? Uh, what does it say? Uh, there has to be a sense of uh, greed, Greed, be greedy. On the one hand, we hear, don't be greedy, and then we hear, actually, you should be greedy. <laughs> I thought we're not supposed to be greedy. No, you should be greedy. <laughs> but what are you greedy for? But of course, greed is the sense of taking something, uh, accumulating something for yourself, and not leaving for others. Whereas uh, the sort of greed that we want is where uh, the more you get, the more you give. Hmm? Lord Chaitanya and his associates, what are they doing? They're plundering the storehouse of the love of God and they're uh, distributing it to everyone. And 
what happens to the storehouse? It, it keeps filling up. Uh, so I guess here the point would be, don't worry if you're feeling some greediness to get Krishna Prema, don't worry, you're not going to deplete the supply. Huh? Don't worry, be greedy. Yeah, this can be a mantra for today. Don't worry, be, be greedy. Yes. 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 Yes, this was uh, uh, the subject of an essay by uh, the late Joseph O'Connell, a professor who studied uh, Gaudiya Vaishnavism uh, for many decades, and he argued against, um, what was his name, Dimmock, Edward Dimmock, who was saying, oh, this Chaitanya Charitamrita, probably the only definite historical things we can take from it is that Lord Chaitanya was born and that he died. What? He said, no, not at all. The associates of Lord Chaitanya were so uh, thrilled that they had th the very supreme personality of God with amongst them that they wanted to record the details of what he said and what happened and wh how he interacted with others and so on. So he makes the point uh, that this is not exactly a biography uh, and it's not a ha hagiography. I think he, he was saying it's a sacred biography. Sacred biography. He like, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yes, my next task related to this, uh, we just discussed it yesterday for promotion of this book, is I need to make a connection between uh, climate change and cow protection in, uh, on a level uh, that will be taken by people. I don't know if I can do it, but um, I'm going to try. <laughs> and then that'll be just an article which uh, we'll make a website and put it on the website and then point people to the book. Anyway, it's a big subject. Yeah. Big subject. But, uh, yes, it's getting a little late. <laughs> okay, Bhutabha. I would say, like this, the short answer is that when the more one is in the spirit of uh, what one scholar called religious reading, as opposed to uh, consumer reading, then this question kind of 
falls into the background such that uh, one feels it is um, w one is hearing with the heart karna, hrit karna. <laughs> and on that level, it really doesn't matter. It's, it's when we're becoming analytical, then it matters. And when we're analytical, then we're having more trouble actually hearing with the hrit karna. <laughs> But sometimes we need to also be analytical, and in that, in that mood, uh, then it could be a, a distinction. It could be a distinction. But then also we take it that the poet is actually capturing uh, an essence which, even if we had been present ourselves with a, with a recording device to the original thing said, we wouldn't get it. The, that's what a poet is, and a, and a, a saint poet is is just that, able to uh, give us the nectar, the essence, so that uh, it will enter the heart uh, through the heart ears. Did that make any sense? Okay. Thank you all so much. Shri Prabhupada Ki Jai. Hare Krishna.